Fine, I'll just send. Oh, uh, sorry, Trey. You missed the one AC because I'm an idiot. Uh, all right. We can go ahead and do cross. Uh, you're good, right? Okay. Yeah, I am good to go. All right, great. Um, let's start cross now. Let's talk about a living wage. Um, can living wage be anything that isn't increasing an hourly wage? Can living wage be anything that isn't increasing an hourly wage? I don't Or think is living so. wage anything but an hourly wage? No. Uh, why? Why? Because I think the other effects that you're probably going to suggest in the neg are not going to cover the sort of living costs that like a person would need. Okay, sure. Uh, let's talk about someone who like is a private contractor, like they repair houses on their own and they have a small business, but they don't make an hourly wage. Uh, why do they not get the same benefits that the affirmative proposes? Do you say an hourly wage or a wage? No, no, no. I like, for example, if someone A is commission like a private, thing. if someone is a private contractor, they don't Right. get an hourly wage. But if they're struggling, why do they not get the benefits of the affirmative? Why would they not get the benefits? Yeah, because you're proposing like increasing like the that the United States sought to require workers receive a living wage. So why are they not workers underneath this definition? Because they aren't. getting the wage i'm confused as to what the question is Okay, whatever we can uh, we can talk about in the one and C. Um, minimizing structural violence. Uh, why should we prefer that? why should we prefer minimizing structural violence Yeah. because this is the affirmative resolution is the only way are you saying like why even Like, minimum why is your value criterion good? the value of criterion is important because structural violence is very imminent in the United States. And thus we need to find a way to reduce that and reducing that through poverty is one of the easiest ways and most effective ways to do it, which is what the affirmative proposes. Okay, sure, that's fine. Let's talk about, okay, let's talk about your inequality contention. So, um, <clears throat> you talk about health, um, how exactly does providing a living wage increase health? Is it just that they get more money to afford health care? Uh, not only that, it kind of reduces the mental health as well, but yeah, it can also allow them to afford, Okay, like, sure. Um, about right. mental health, how does one quantify that? Like, what does your evidence say about that? The evidence basically states that improvement in worker well-being, it says that it positively impacts being, and it also Okay, how do you measure reduces well-poverty. being? Like, did they send out a survey to everyone? It was like, do you feel happier now that you have more money? Like, what? Well, how do you measure that? measure well-being Yeah, because you and say well-being. like increasing wages improves mental health and decreases stress. How do you measure that? Well, by like reportation and like surveys Okay, and so people like self-report. yeah. All right, that's fine. Um, all right, on your second contention of productivity, I thought that was time. is it? I'm at Oh wow, yeah, yeah. that is time. All right, Okay. uh. Usually at this point, people would take like two-ish minutes of prep or take running prep, but uh, I'm going to do the annoying Durham Academy thing and not take prep. Okay. Uh, I'm good to start. If you are uh, seven minutes, the order is going to be Yeah. uh, NCAC. Mm -hmm. Everyone switch flows, uh, get your pencils Next or pens column. ready. Make sure that your column is labeled one and C. If not, that's a problem. Uh, if everyone's good, I'll go and start. Time starts on my first word. <clears throat> I negate. I agree to the value of morality. The value criterion I offer in this round is maximizing societal welfare through creating the most amount of pleasure while minimizing pain. Prefer one, it is intuitive. It establishes that pain is bad and pleasure is good, which are obvious moral intuitions that form the basis of ethical decision-making, making a prerequisite to any other weighing mechanism. 
It's number two, util allows us to degre determine degrees of wrongness. For example, breaking a promise to take your dying mom to the hospital is worse than breaking a promise to meet a friend at a party. Although the actions of breaking a promise are the same, the consequences of one have a much higher severity than the other, which can only be determined through a framework of utilitarianism. Three, it's actor specific. The government always prioritizes maximizing its general welfare of their nation, operating under a utilitarian basis. Contention one is the economy. Wage hikes decrease employment, increase prices, destroy businesses, and kill employee benefits. Boring 22. Meta-analysis, just 5% of studies found wage hikes increased employment. An overwhelming majority, 79.3%, found hikes had a negative effect. In the long term, find much larger harmful effects. Companies pass wage increase onto consumers via higher prices. This will reduce income gains. Weaker profits will increase fir firm deaths, risking jobs. Wage increases in San Francisco predict increases in exit among restaurants. Lower profit rates will discourage business startups and firm entry, reducing job opportunities. Pay gains are offset by changes to compensation. Companies reduced hours, making them ineligible ineligib for benefits. And the affirmative kills small businesses and the economy. Shava et al. 19. Small businesses are vital, accounting for 50% of GDP, 70% of job gains, and wages comprise a significant fraction of cost faced by small businesses. An increase in labor costs may impact margins and financially stress the system. A dollar increase in minimum wage corresponds to a reduction in credit score. An increase in minimum wage corresponds to an increase in exit probability by 25% increase. Wage costs can impact financial health. Establishments are 12% more likely to default on bank loans. Aggregate employment declines significantly. Businesses default on debt and cut employment. Minimum wages lead to a higher exit risk. We provide evidence of financial stress for 15 million small businesses and higher minimum wages like a living wage guarantee forces prices up which turns the case much 22 higher minimum wages inevitably increase production costs which can be absorbed by di dismissing workers raising prices increases in minimum wage to average wage ratio positively contribute to higher inflation the minimum wage exerts greater inflationary pressure with strong labor markets, more competition among employers, increased labor costs to consumers, even if the minimum wage increases do not lead to large disemployment effects. They generate additional inflationary pressure, especially during an economic boom in regions with low unemployment. Increases cause further inflationary pressure on goods and services with low elasticity of demand. Even if the affirmative is correct that the case would provide several benefits for the American worker, the problems quickly arise as we zoom out and look at everything happening now. Now, and that why why there makes their plan such a bad idea. The second contention is healthcare. Employers decrease full time work in hours. Yonazawa at L twenty two. Wage hikes have a profound effect on businesses. Retailers may adjust employment. Retailers substitute by substitute respond by substituting full time for less expensive part time. We find a positive significant relationship in retailers reducing the amount of full time workers while shortening hours. Full time works is a major source of income. It is more impacted by reductions, which means the loss of human capital and. Part-time work kills health benefits with less hours that circumvent ACA requirements, Tennessee 13. By defining full-time work as 30 or more hours per week and requiring companies with full-time employees to provide health coverage, the ACA incentivizes businesses to cut hours of employees who work between 30 to 40 hours each week to less than 30 to avoid having to provide health insurance and... Uninsurance is a major health hazard and causes thousands of deaths. Shalabi 17, 45,000 Americans die each year as a direct result of becoming uninsured. A uh, lack of health insurance had a mortality hazard ratio of 1.4. Americans without health insurance were 40% more likely to die than those with it. I will now go on to rebut my opponent's case. Starting on framework, it is clear that me and my opponent disagree on framework because they seem to want to prioritize the least well off and I prioritize <clears throat> maximizing general well-being and minimizing general pain. However, you can see in my contentions that if the affirmative is adopted, people, everyone, not just those who are worse off, will be uniformly worse off in the world of the affirmative, which means that we have to analyze these metal risks in regard to the resolution on their first contention, subpoint A and B. Studies prove wage loss harm minority employment, Lao 21. Within two years of the wage increase, unemployment doubled to 24% for black counterparts. The economists repeatedly noted the harmful effect of wage laws on workers from minority backgrounds. Backgrounds. Minimum wage advocates sacrifice the jobs of some to raise the wages of others. Racial minorities are at risk of being priced out of the labor market. A study concluded based on wage increases over three decades that increasing the minimum wage was linked to a 2% decrease in employment for migrants. Start advocating abolition of minimum wage laws. And... <clears throat> 
Wage increases boost unemployment, which are the most recent studies. Seven night of um, July 19th, Broccolina and Tan 21. In 2022, Maryland's minimum wage increased. The minimum wage law had a negative significant impact on employment when we implement a rigorous model. The higher minimum wage caused unemployment to increase. And companies will avoid requirements. Wage theft makes more money. MIT SOC May 23. Companies aren't complying with minimum wage requirements. The penalties rarely match severities. Current enforcement structures incentivize non-compliance. Wage theft is widespread. Companies that want to comply may be outcompeted. 40% of fast food restaurants and 85% of garment industry employers were underpaying. Penalties are low. And on sub point C, my second contention turns this. Less people have access to health care when a minimum wage is increased up to a living wage, which means that health is overall worse in the world of the affirmative. On their second contention, a 3% increase in minimum wage decreases productivity by 7%. This is theoretically and empirically verified. Hill 18, empirical evidences show that increases in wage cause workers to decrease productivity. Policies where workers are paid rate on earnings. Productivity is easily observed. Minimum wage decreases in productivity. The wage floor removes incentive by the piece rate. Productivity over two seasons during which employer raises the minimum wage causes workers to slow 3% increases cause the worker to decrease productivity by 7%. And all of their arguments presume the ability to be able to rectify this issue in the status quo. However, throughout our entire case, we have illustrated problems with the economy and healthcare, which turn their contentions, which means that at the end of the day, they might be good for some people. But if the negative is able to prove that we are worse for more people, this means you must vote negative because this is a much larger impact than anything the affirmative can prove. Ready for cross. I haven't given the speech in a while. <laughs> okay. Uh okay. So let me set a timer. Okay. Time starts. Now, so in your San Francisco example, you said that it didn't work. Can you elaborate on that? Can you like reread that card? Oh, is that on the first contention? I believe so. It was about economy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was our Born 22 card. It says that wage increases in San Francisco predicted increases in exit among like restaurants because like companies um when increasing um when increasing the wages, they suddenly A are priced out, which means that they're not able to afford paying these people. And two, it disincentivizes companies from like increasing their workforce, actually it causes them to decrease it to make up for the lost amount of money that they have. Um I can go on. Okay, but but in the affirmative, I talked about how it was actually successful in almost like 22 cities and it was successful among eight states as well. So, uh, yeah, sure. We have a meta analysis that said 5.8% of the studies found that wage hikes increased employment. It's 79.3 examples showed hikes having a negative effect, which means that those 22 examples are probably part of that 5.8% of studies that said they had increased employment. Wait, could you read that again? I'm sorry, I could. Yeah. Our meta-analysis showed that 5.8% of, um, it's also in the Born 22 evidence, it's in the first half. We say that mm -hmm. the overwhelming majority of um, examples, analyses, and studies, which is a part of this meta-analysis, which is why we call it meta-analysis, showed that having rate hikes, having, having a significant negative effect with the impact stronger for those who are worse off. Okay, so about like your value criteria and why is societal welfare like relevant to this again? Yeah. Like so I think, over. yeah. So yeah. your argument is that we should minimize structural violence and focus mm -hmm. on current minority harm. Our argument is that we should maximize societal welfare writ large because the thesis of the negative is that sure, the affirmative might prove beneficial for certain groups of people. But if we are able to win that the policies of the affirmative are bad for everyone, not just those who are worse off, this means we obviously outweigh on a magnitude scale. Right. Okay, so by your contention number one, you talk about how it kills small businesses and how it essentially increase like it like decreases into job loss. How about the fact? Have you could you like read that card again? I like Loki missed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so our warranting for this is the Shava nineteen evidence. We say that small businesses account for fifty percent of the GDP and 70% of job gains. Because small businesses mm -hmm. have to bear the brunt of raising wages, this means that they are priced out and they don't increase their profits, which means that they're not able to sustain their business. And it's either 
you believe that small businesses can afford this, which goes on to link into all of our other arguments, or they can't afford mm -hmm. this, which sort of buys into this argument. Okay, so I think I can see the rest of my time because there's cool. like five seconds left. All right. Okay, so I'll be taking running prep time starting now. Was that too fast? No, I think that was good. Oh, uh, everyone like else put in the, the chat. Yeah, I was going to say, everyone else put in the chat if you want me to slow down during the next speech. Great. Oh shit, someone else is here. Okay, so that was two minutes exactly. So I have two more minutes left of prep time. Elise, I have class at 12. What is that for? Oh, uh, yeah, in the chat. I'm assuming order is going to be ACNC. ACNC? Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry right. that, that took me a minute. Uh, give me one second. I'm gonna drink some water. Oh, did y'all have school? Damn, it's Sunday. What am I saying? Okay. Okay, so time. Okay, so first I'm actually gonna start with framework and then I'll go A C N C. So Great. it's like the same, it's basically the same thing. So there's like really not that much difference. Okay. Time starts. Oh my god, it's been a while. Okay, time starts. Now, okay, the first thing my opponent says about societal welfare is that pleasure outweighs pain and the whole thing on utilitarianism, but structural, um, uh, but psychologists Deborah Winter and Dela, Dana Layton explained structural violence questions have painful answers for the privileged elite. Our normal perceptual processes divide people in into in and out groups. Those outside our group lie out, outside of our scope of justice. Injustice is barely noticed if it occurs those who are invisible. Those who fall outside are morally excluded. So if our main value is morality under this, we notice that the people who are excluded and that is like that is essentially physically and that is essentially immoral now moving on to my opponent's case they talk about that they're in that way minimizing structural violence outweighs their thing on societal welfare due to the fact that it's simply more immoral to be leading people out and all these injustices that are occurring now moving on to their first contention of economy and how economy and their wage wage employment and how it kills small businesses we and then yeah how it kills small businesses first thing that we can read on that is about their inflation claim is that which slam 13 states fear of inflation from minimum wage is not based on any reasonable description 
impact on the overall price level is too small to impact inflation. Other ways firms can adjust lower turnover rates and greater worker predict pro greater productivity. 10% hike can be expected to produce cost increase of less than one tenth of 1%, marking up $100 price to $100.10. COLA increases are much, much smaller. Negli negligible impact on 2.6% of average inflation rate supported by a 2008 study. So we see how essentially their entire point on inflation and how that's going to increase is also debunked in that thing. Now, moving on to small businesses, we have a we have a thing saying that moving boosting the wage makes businesses more efficient and reduces the high school dropout rate. Guess scale 23 states small businesses don't cut jobs in response to an increase in the minimum. In, in increase in the wage benefit from it instead minimum wage kills job vacancies not jobs a higher wage makes it easier to recruit and retain them turnover rates go down workers more productive minimum wage set at $15 or higher improve the financial security of employees without job cuts businesses manage the higher cost without having to reduce staff or profit. Small price increase did not drive them away. Higher wages result in less turnover, advertising, less training for workers, which benefits the owners. 10% increase in wage reduces the high school dropout rate of about 10% among students. So in that, we essentially say we turn over their entire small businesses claim about the entire thing about saying how like it essentially increases the labor's cost, their minimum wage, and all of that other things, and how they're going to be outcompeted, underemploying. What we can easily tell that that's simply not true. And then moving on to their comp competition among employers and all, of, and that and those claims, we can also see that. Sorry, we can also see that about their productivity claims that living wage laws have small to moderate have small studies, Chapman and Thompson six states, living wage laws have small effects on municipal budgets. A detailed survey of 20 studies found that the budgetary effect had been consistently overestimated. Actual costs tend to be less than one tenth of the overall budget. Two studies of the Baltimore study of Los Angeles, three New England found study found that living wage law, living wage benefits working families and no negative effects. Los Angeles, Baltimore, Boston empirical studies found no evidence of diminished employment. Los Angeles, Francis, 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 San Francisco, wage found employment ex increased. And then these are other examples that we have seen that living wage actually helps the people that the, essentially the negative is claiming not to help. And the negative is essentially claiming that it is going to hurt more people than help. And the affirmative and their contention number two about healthcare is easily debunked by previous claims. And we can see that the effects, the effects far outweigh in the affirmative as well. And yeah, I urge you to vote for an affirmative ballot. That's time. I spoke a little fast and I was all over the place. I apologize. I usually am not this bad game. Yo, hold on. My light turned out because this building sucks. Uh, mm -hmm. let me. All right. I will not. Apparently, walking turns the lights back on. Uh, hold on. Sorry. Uh. Okay. Wait. Quick question, Elise. Does Pulakish just join this? Philip, do you have like a timer on this Zoom or can it just go on for like? Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Timer where? What? In the hall? For this Zoom meet. Like there's no like time limit, right? Oh, no. Yeah. Because it's institution. Okay. Could you just like wait until. Wait, if you leave, does the whole thing turn off though? No. Okay. Wait, why? Well, I mean, you can stay too if you want. Because I have, me and Elise have to like help two novices oh also everyone's here is like welcome to stay we're just gonna like uh everyone here because there's only like eight of y'all um we're just gonna be helping people with their cases and stuff philip you, you can also just stay and help as well yeah i'll probably like... stay until i get pairings for the next round i'm supposed to judge um but if yeah. i leave i'll probably just transfer ownership to one of y'all and okay yeah. all yeah. right uh what is it prep four minutes of prep i'll start now okay. we can keep talking yeah, so sorry, like if I'm like disturbing you or whatever. But for those of you who are here, um, me and Elise are probably just gonna like go over not really, it's not gonna be lectured thing, it's anything, it's like more personalized. So if you guys wanna like talk about your cases, we'll help you like develop arguments, refine them. Office hours, exactly. Thank you, Elise. Um, basically just office hours. So y'all want to like pull up your cases. We'll like go over it specifically, which um, sort of arguments you're going to hit, which arguments you can easily combat. And yeah, so that's going to be that.
Paul reviewing case is my favorite. Yeah, so Elise can't talk because her doctor told her she's like her voice is gone. So then she's been prescribed on medication, so she can't talk. I've never heard doctors actually having to do that before. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's better for her also not to just like start like, oh, she's on steroids. So, yeah. Damn, can't believe you got Elise on Roy's before me, bro. <laughs> Nah, don't don't use steroids, kids. I thought about it for a while, but it's not worth it. Yeah, I don't think I don't think that has ever crossed my mind. But for everybody else in here, don't use steroids. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. That's true. Sometimes you need them, like when you get rabies. Oh. Oh my! This is about to die. Also, for the novices here, sometimes when your opponent takes prep, you can take this time to, like, organize your stuff and, like, come up with an argument or, like, come up with a strand of reasoning to um uh, uh go for in the 2AR or the 2NR, whichever speech it is. And then just take this time to, like, cohesively think of a narrative that you can do to tell the judge and convince them that you're winning. And do voters' issues. Get that yes. out during this time. Oh, it's been two minutes. Uh oh, I have that's eh, fine. I'll I'll stop there. Um just to emulate how a real round actually is, because oh, usually okay. people only have two minutes left at this point. So I, I can go. Um all right. Okay. Order the two and R will be framing at the top and then Afneg. Mm -hmm. Uh I'll give y'all like 15 seconds to convert organized flows. Wow, it got dark fast. What the? Yeah. Oh, 6.48, too. What? I still haven't eaten yet. Something that happens when you get to college is that you have to learn how to live. Believe that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm good. I think y'all are good. Uh, hopefully, if you're good, Titus. Titus, yes, I'm in college. I am a first year. Oh, because he wasn't here. He's when Atticus's I my... younger brother. <laughs> like your face. Okay, my con okay. The connections are making sense now. That makes sense. <laughs> yes, Atticus, cool guy. Yeah. Uh, Johns Hopkins University. Go Blue Jays. I think I have. Yep. Hell yeah. Wrapping your college, very nice. Yep. Uh. Oh yeah. For I think some of y'all weren't here. I think actually it was just Titus. But yeah. Hi, I'm Philip. I was president and captain and did stuff. And this is my first year not doing that because I'm well, in college. Still coaching us, so like technically you're you're very present. My presence is present enough. All right, time to start. <clears throat> I remember again framework A C N C. At the end of the day, your ballot will be on who is able to maximize the most effect on the greatest number of people. On to framework. The first argument here is they are not able to win. That minimizing structural violence is the most moral in this round. Two reasons. First is that we have won that utilitarianism is intuitive. It establishes that pain is bad and pleasure is good. These are obvious moral intuitions. And these are at the basis of every single decision that we make, which means that at the end of the debate, if you are dubious about whether something minimizes structural violence, violence, you can default to the fact that something can be weighed through a cost-benefit analysis, which is very easy to evaluate. But the second argument is game-ending. It's actor-specific. The government, which is the actor in this resolution, always prioritizes maximizing general welfare of a nation, which operates under utilitarianism. Look at the resolution. We are arguing about whether the United States of America, or there's just a United States, ought to do something, which means that insofar as the U.S. takes actions that preserve the general welfare of everybody in the community, Community. This means that we ought to prioritize the general welfare of everybody. However, we will still be able to outweigh under both frameworks and it will be done later. On case. 
Game over on case they conceded three pieces of evidence that make it impossible for you to vote affirmative. First things first is the Lao evidence. Studies prove that wage laws harm minority employment. This is a great study. It says that a study published in the 2017 journal Contemporary Economic Policy concluded based on 185 provincial minimum wage increases that over span over three decades that increasing minimum wage was linked to a 2% decrease in employment for immigrants specifically, which means that we will extend another card later that talks about broad unemployment but specifically un even if you do buy that they win the framing of structural minimizing structural violence we have one that wage laws harm might harm immigrant participation in the economy which means that this is something that you have to prioritize star and bolt on your flow because this means that the entire case which is predicated on employing minorities is not actually going to happen so you should be highly suspect of any 2 ar push that they make on this argument the next card that we want to mention is the mit soc 20 May 23, um, May 23 evidence, which is incredibly good. Wage theft is something that inc that exists right now, and companies will evade these requirements. This means that even if the affirmative requires that workers receive a living wage, companies will take any measure necessary to avoid having to do this. Companies themselves want to maximize their own profits, and it we will stop at no cost to be able to do that. This evidence is from the MIT Sloan Office of Communications from this May, which means you should hold this at a very very high bar. Wage theft is widespread. Companies that want to comply are outcompeted. This is an inherent argument that you are unable to be the workers don't a don't realize that they're being underpaid b there are concerns about retaliation and each firm only has a 1.4 percent chance of being caught which means that there is nothing about the affirmative the in the united states enacting this proposal that actually causes minorities to be able to benefit because companies will circumvent this argument however there is one more argument that we want to extend this is the third sub point they conceded the hill 18 evidence and this is a shutter down argument on the second contest we have one that a 3% increase in minimum wage decreases productivity by 7%, which is empirically and theoretically verified. Decreases in productivity is theoretically justified because it removes the incentive for people to actually, uh, it, re it removes the incentive that people want to have to work harder because it, underneath a lower wage, people would work more because they would make more money that way. But in a society with a higher wage, they will not work as hard because they will have to, they will be able to do less work and still make the same amount of money as they were being able to make in the past. For example, for a seven for a seven dollar and fifty cent wage, you would need to work twelve hours to make a certain amount of money. But under a fifteen dollar wage, you would only need to work six hours, which means that it is natural that productivity will decrease. And the theoretical justification is very and and the empirical justification is true because the Hill eighteen evidence cites studies that show a decrease by seven percent productivity in an increase in three percent, which means Okay, the argument, the arguments are incredibly clear. First things first, uh, the, the uh, wage laws do not actually increase and actually harm minority employment. And even if we do buy that the plan uh, that the um that the resolution is passed, this means that companies will still find any way to circumvent these guidelines, which means that there's nothing that the affirmative actually does to be able to help minorities. But um again, the second contention also proves that minimum wage decreases productivity, which is bad. Onto the negative case. They mishandled the they, they mishandled the small businesses argument, the argument that they talked about talked about returning sort of like high schoolers into the economy. But this is not this this this, this they 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 inherently lose on a time frame argument. Our plan we are assuming that the affirmative is happening right now. That's why it's a bad thing. We are our Shava et al. Nineteen evidence is incredibly good. It talks about how the harms or the, the harms that will happen will happen immediately and it will happen fast. But we cannot wait for high schoolers to get the experience and go into the job. We cannot wait for them to go back into the job the job market because by the time they graduate from high school they will need to get a four-year degree they will need to enter into the economy they will need to get this experience before they're able to benefit from this increasing wage policy which means that our first contention definitely outweighs in terms of time frame on the second contention none of their arguments that they made were specific enough this is about health insurance a higher wage means employers will not compensate their benefits because it's costing them more money to give them a higher wage and give health insurance which means that a higher wage means less health insurance and we have won the claim from our Shalabi 17 evidence that 45% 45, 45,000 Americans die each year as a result of being uninsured, which means okay. The, the arguments in this round is if we are worse, if we have won that the affirmative is worse for more people than the people that they help, you vote negative. Okay.
So really quick, just to make, this is like for the novices, because, okay, so Philip said that I didn't respond to those arguments, right? So as the affirmative, I'm not allowed to respond to those arguments in the 2AR. Does that make sense? You guys should not be doing that. But also, if you notice your opponent is doing that, I highly recommend not calling it out or telling your judges because a lot of judges will vote against you on that. But just so you know, I can't respond to those arguments because I didn't respond to them in the 1AR. Same thing is that, like, for example, if Philip didn't respond to some of my arguments in the 1NR, he wouldn't have been able to respond to those arguments in the 2NR, which he just gave. Okay? Yeah, so um, uh, this is also assuming that you actually didn't respond to them, because sometimes your opponents would just lie and say they didn't respond to something. Right. But, like, if you actually didn't, just don't. Just don't do it, because then, like, you're, like, going against the rules, right? Okay. So I'll be taking running prep time starting now. Okay, all right, that's time. Okay, so really quickly, I'm going to go back. I'm going to start with the framework debate, then we're going to do... I'm sorry, we're going to do AF case, then NEG case. Or should I do it the other way? I'm probably going to do NEG case and then AF case and then I'm going to do voters issues it's my bad okay so this is going to be the three minute three minutes right three minutes uh three minute to AR and basically time starts now my mo my opponent and I both agree that morality is our main value. So now their po their point about util being pain is bad and pleasure is good and how it dictates every single choice in our life. Util says that essentially that the majority is better than the like we have to cater to the majority more than the minority. And the point that I am making is that it is immoral to do so because you are leaving out a certain group of people, which is what structural violence is inherently. And the thing is, they talk about the United States and how that's their main goal, and that's the exact problem. The United States government is not being moral by essentially going by these util policies, and therefore they should be enacting this policy to minimize that. That is the point of the affirmative, and that's what the affirmative is intending to do. So that means that under this value criterion and under morality, by not leaving people out and by discriminatory to be discriminatory doing that, minimizing structural violence should be the main value criterion. Now moving on to the negative case, to the um, negative claims on the affirmative. So they talk to 
sorry, they talk to the negative claims. Now they talk, they talk about the economy and how essentially that we don't respond to their small business claim and all about the, uh, and all of these other things that they had stated before. Now we need to go into the fact that again, as stated before in the 1AR, we talk about how small businesses are inherently not affected by these policies and they are actually flourishing from this. We see examples point blank of people doing well from, of people doing well in certain states because of the policies that they have enacted. And we see a physical example of living wage enactments doing well in several different countries. Not to mention they talk about the economy and then they go on about what wage loss harms and all about this, about how it's affecting the general the general public. But we have to look at the fact that in the, the, um, the affirmative talks about poverty. They talk about 6.3 million people in the working class that we are benefiting. We talk about food insecurity, which inherently we have to do as the United States government because there has not been action taken over the past 10, like over the past couple of years. The point is that the affirmative, the point that the affirmative is making is that in order for us to move on, to, to move forward and help these people that we have not been doing is that we need to enact these policies so we can help the work the lower class which disproportionately affects people of color and people and certain and women and all these other people now moving on to their claims about health and all these other things what the what the affirmative has stated before in the 1ar and what the affirmative is stating now is that inherently their point about health health insurance and all these other things is simply not true simply to the fact that again if people are being paid more they'll be able to thus be able to work better. And we have proved time and time again about our work productivity stuff stated in the 1IR again, that productivity rates are actually increased by this, not decreased as the as the one in our states. We can go back to cards cards stated in the 1IR about productivity, product, productivity rates working, examples of this inherently working, and how living wage in as a whole will help the United States. And for this reason, I urge an affirmative ballot. Thank you. And that's time. Guys, I like low key sold on the one AR. I type should shit. no. Oh, I wasn't saying type shit to that, but that was good. When's the last time you gave a speech? Uh, let's think. Calendar. Yeah, I'm looking like, at my calendar right now because I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I didn't compete in April. Seven months ago. Wow. Did I compete in March? Yeah, that was March. When was districts? April or March? March. Yeah. So <laughs> seven Ooh. months ago. And me and Savannah did not do our practice debate. And then instead we all just stayed on call and talked for our one hour. So that's our bad. Man, I was gonna wait. I was gonna oh wait, no, I couldn't pull up, huh? You couldn't pull up. And since no one was there and we already started talking, we just kind of like yapped for like an hour or two. I mean, that's kind of how one that's kind of how like varsity we didn't have practices that's kind of just how we did, did stuff last year <laughs> yeah but yeah uh all right um does anyone should okay I ask that? so this is my flow this is like one of my bad flows because i didn't do anything I like blanked out when you were giving your one in our speech. So I didn't respond to half the things in the one IR. So typically you want to respond to all of your opponents. Do you want an RFP? Sure, Elise, go for it. Don't talk. She's not. She's going to type it up. Okay. Man, this is some anticipatory stuff, bro. So okay, so like... how many of you, how much more time before this meeting? Did you guys have to prepare? Uh, I opened this the, this stuff. The, literally, <laughs> I opened the document for the first time before I was going to give my speech. I also didn't know the topic until like last week. <laughs> yeah. So I did research. I did neg heavy research. So like I was good on the neg. I didn't know what the fuck to do. This is my first time reading through the case. Like not like I read through it. This is my first time speaking and like timing the case and like yeah, yeah. See, I coach, yeah, I so yeah. I knew the topic, but I didn't know like how to debate it. I just cut arguments. But like, I I have students competing at tournaments now. Adati and Savannah are two of them. So I was like, oh dang, I actually have to know how arguments interact now. So about about a week ago, I started like 
getting down and just being like, okay, is this true? How does this interact with this? How does this interact with this? And yeah. See, and you learn half of that by what's an RFD. Reason and for decision, basically like feedback and who they voted for. Okay, so we're going to go over stuff that you shouldn't do that I did. Okay. All so right, first come thing. on. Okay, no, okay, we'll just like go over it. So in the 1AC, I talked really, like, generally, you want to, you guys, especially as novices, you guys are going to talk a lot slower than what me and Philip did. Yeah. But, like, once you get in sort of, like, a flow, like, you'll start just, like, talking fast in general. So, like, you guys don't have to worry about that. Your opponents will not be talking as fast as us, like, on average. Like, they're going to talk, like, normally like this. They're going to, like, at most, they'll enunciate stuff, like, especially as, like, a novice. So, yeah, you guys don't have to worry about that. Cross-examination, I think my, like, I didn't ask, like, good questions. Like, I feel like on average, like, you want to ask, you need to make their case look stupid, which I didn't do. I don't think either of us did that, to I don't be think, honest. I don't think cross-examination was too good for this debate, to be completely honest. It was kind of like, yeah, but I think we had good, um rebuttals i think my 2ar was my better rebuttal i kind of sold on the 1ar your 2nr was good i think i like the 2nr um okay so the one thing you guys will notice is that me and philip had a lot more cards than you guys did and one another thing that you guys would have noticed is that we didn't really outline like this is my claim, this is the warrant, this is the link, this is the impact. Like, we didn't like say it out loud. It was kind of like implied, if that makes sense. When I was a novice, I joined in like the middle of the year. So I never like really learned the claim warrant impact like sort of format. So I just kind of like went into it. But for novices, you guys do want to highlight that. So you guys understand the argument structure so that you're able to rebut it a lot easier. Because then if you guys like, Remember, I think Philip talked about how like he like referenced referenced back to his warrant and he like referenced back to certain links throughout the rebuttals, which you is easier to do when you like know the format of an argument. Okay, so do we have any questions at all? Any any comments? Any concerns? How was flowing it? Oh yeah, I was gonna say I feel like we uh don't expect. To flow. Oh shit, I forgot to stop recording. <laughs>